On this video, we will share some of the best things that we did in the outer areas of Edinburgh. This is part 3 of our Edinburgh series, so when you finish the video, be sure to check out our part 1 and 2 as well. Portobello Beach is a coastal suburb 3 miles east of Edinburgh, facing the Firth of Forth and just 20 minutes away from Princess Streets in Edinburgh. The area offers a nice escape from the hustle and bustle of the city, with ice cream parlors, arcades and beachside cafes found all along the promenade, making it the perfect place to spend a sunny afternoon or even a winter one if you're trying to blow away those cobwebs. The beach hosts popular events in beach volleyball, including the Olympic Beach Volleyball Qualifiers and the annual Big Beach Busk event, as well as triathlon events. It is very easy to reach Portobello Beach by car, but if you need public transportation, Portobello is served by the Lothian buses and the East Coast buses, which provide 11 services to the area daily. Other community activities focus more on the sea. They include the Portobello Sailing, Kayaking and Rowing Club, Row Party and Eastern Amateur Coastal Rowing Club. This beach provides a great opportunity for families to let their kids run and play, as well as make little sand castles. In 2019, Portobello was voted the best neighborhood in the UK at the 2020 Urbanism Awards, and in 2021 it was considered by a Sunday Times panel to be one of the top 8 places to live in Scotland. After walking around and enjoying the beach a little bit, we had a really good dinner at the Esplanade on the promenade. The Kelpies are two gigantic horse steel statues at the site of the M9 on Helix Park in Falkirk, constructed on a Forth and Clyde Canal in the heart of industrial Scotland. They are located 41 minutes away from Edinburgh and can be reached easily by car, or if going by bus or train, you may need to get a taxi the rest of the way or walk another 30 to 40 minutes from Falkirk Grahamston Station. The steel horses were built in 2013 by the sculptor Andy Scott, who also designed the 30-meter high sculptures to celebrate the heavy horses that once pulled the barges along the waterway, linking Edinburgh and Glasgow, and also the horses which worked in the fields. Each head has 1,200 tons of steel-enforced concrete foundations, 900 stainless steel scales and weighs 300 tons. They were built on-site in only 90 days, however years of planning preceded this. Besides the amazing statues, there are some scenic canal towpaths, cycle routes, play areas and cozy cafes nearby, so there really is something for everyone in this area. Craigmiller Castle is one of the best-preserved medieval castles in Scotland. 
built in the 14th century and used as a country residence, the lands were given to the Preston family in 1342. The building of the castle went on from the 15th and 16th centuries. On the death of Sir Robert Preston in 1639, Craig Miller passed to a distant cousin, David Preston of Whitehill. His son sold the castle out of the family, and it was bought by Sir John Gilmer. The castle fell into ruins in the 18th century when the Gilmores moved to a new residence. It is now in the care of Historic Environment Scotland as a scheduled monument and is open to the public. We weren't even sure if we could make it to Craig Miller during our trip, but we are so glad we did as this castle is packed with so much history and intrigue as well as being able to explore every corner and imagine how life was in its early days. The courtyard wall was probably added by Sir William Preston around 1453, who had traveled to France and drew on continental inspiration for his new work. In 1511, Craig Miller was erected into a barony and the outer courtyard was built around this time, possibly by another Simon Preston. Craig Miller Castle is best known for its association with Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary stayed at Craig Miller twice, the first time in 1563 when she met the English ambassador Thomas Randolph at the castle. And then she also stayed in 1566 when she rode into the courtyard to stay with her lawyer supporter Sir Simon Preston. At a time of terrible stress, she fell ill and stayed there to recuperate. Her lords then hatched a plan to get rid of her vain, violent, and ambitious husband, Lord Henry Darnley. This became known as the most notorious plot in Scottish history known as Craig Miller's Bond, which would shape Mary's life and end Lord Darnley's life. Mary is traditionally said to have slept in a small former kitchen within the tower house, although it's more likely that she occupied the larger accommodation in the New East Range. This was the finest bedroom in the castle, and it may have been here that Mary, Queen of Scots, recovered from her illness in 1566, while her lords hatched a plan against her husband. The castle's hall is where the laird and lady would dine with their household and receive honored guests. The hall would have colorful tapestries hung and painted beams overhead. People would seat according to rank, with the laird and lady at the high table. Chicken, lamb, pork and wine were luxuries served only to the nobility, while the lower ranks made do with beef, salt, meat and beer. During the so-called rough wooing of Henry VIII of England, where the English attempted to impose by military force a marriage between Edward, Prince of Wales, and the infant Mary, Queen of Scots. The English troops burned Craig Miller Castle and took all the spoils. Sir Simon Preston had the castle repaired as a fine residence and planted formal gardens in line with the latest fashions. This room was built as the Gilmer's kitchen originally, but it was later converted into a stable.
Craig Miller has been used for many films and television productions. In Outlander, it was used in season 3 as Arzmir Prison, where Jamie was imprisoned with other Jacobites after the Battle of Culloden. In this scene, Lord John walks out into the courtyard, and you can see this beautiful tree here in real life as well. In this scene, fans of Outlander will recognize the part where Jamie confronts Lord John in regards to his promise to kill him which ends up being discharged. About 50 minutes away from Edinburgh Centre, by car, the village of Falkland makes you feel like you stepped back into time. Falkland is located in the Kingdom of Fife and packs a lot of Scottish history. The population here is just over 1,100. Falkland Palace was the country retreat and hunting lodge of the Royal Stuart Dynasty, and it was a favorite of Mary Queen of Scots back in the 1500s as she would play tennis at the Royal Tennis Court in the palace's garden. Her father, King James V, died here after the Battle of Solway Moss. And Mary's son, King James VI and I of Scotland and England, took shelter here from the plague in 1585. Today, protected by the National Trust for Scotland, the palace is open for visitors and displays tapestries, painted ceilings, and the world's oldest tennis court. We did not have the opportunity to visit it last time, but hope to do so in the future. And again, for any Outlander fans, the village will be recognized as being the 1940s and 1960s version of Inverness. Bruce Fountain was used in several episodes and is especially famous in Season 1, Episode 1. This first scene is where Claire and Frank arrive in Inverness, 1940s after World War II, for a second honeymoon. Bruce Fountain was used as the focal point in several episodes and can be viewed in this scene where Jamie is standing next to the fountain, staring up at Claire through the window. Here's our version of recreating that scene in real life. And the Covenanter Hotel is a real bed and breakfast and was also used in the show as Mrs. Baird's B&B. If you do decide to visit this beautiful and historic little village, we highly recommend walking around and exploring and taking some good photos. And if time allows, be sure to check out the historic parts of the village, such as the Falcon Palace. We had lunch at a delicious pub nearby called the Stag Inn. The food was delicious.
Hope Castle is a 16th century tower house in Scotland. It is situated on a Hopetown estate, about 4 kilometers or 2.5 miles to the west of South Queen's Ferry on the outskirts of Edinburgh. From Edinburgh city centre, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to arrive here by car. So if your question is why is this place even popular, well, it is featured as a location in the Outlander TV series Jamie Fraser's family home called Lallybrock, also known as Brock Tuarak. The cost to enter is £5 per person, but be sure to check their open hours on their website as this is a private part of the estate as well as a working farm and there are times when there may be live filming. This summer of June 2022, the site was set up for filming of Outlander Season 7, as you can see from the big blue walls they built, as well as some additional details that are not part of the original building, as you can see here from footage from our trip of last year, 2021. Mid Hope Castle was used to house farm workers after the building of nearby Hopetown House, and in 1851, around 53 people from 10 different families lived here or nearby, but a little later it was abandoned and is now semi-derelict, although outside it was consolidated in 1998. The castle lies on the extensive Hopetown estate, which we will show you in a separate video. This scene is interesting to see all the props put in place to show how pretty and well lived in the castle could be. In 1988, some restoration work began, including the replacement of the roof and some new window frames into the existing openings. In 2013, Mid Hope was chosen as a film location for the TV series Outlander. The modern windows and door are not part of the original building as well and were placed here for filming, so this was pretty fun to see as a sneak peek for season 7. If you want to see what's behind this big blue wall, keep watching till the very end and we'll show you. In this scene, this is where Claire returns to Scotland in the 1960s and has some memories of Jamie of when she went back in time in the 1700s. This family crest is not part of Mid Hope Castle and was placed there for filming of Outlander, so it was pretty cool to see it as it would have been on the show. The initials shown here are of Alexander Drummond and his wife Marjorie Bruce, who took ownership of Mid Hope in 1587. There isn't much to see behind a Mid Hope building, with the exception of a couple possible storage sheds that are in need of a good restoration, as well as some nice landscaping done. There are rumors of a distillery being planned to open on these grounds in fixing up Mid Hope. Once the development is complete, visitors should be able to access the repaired parts of the castle, which are set to be revamped to include tasting, meeting and dining rooms. Now wouldn't that be something nice for Outlander fans? So if you watched this far, thank you for sticking here with us. And as promised, here's the behind the scenes of the big blue wall. We're not sure what this was supposed to be, but I'm sure we'll find out in season 7. And if anyone knows, feel free to let us know in the comments. If you haven't yet, check out our other Scotland videos on our channel after this. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to watch part 4, where we explore some more things to do in the outskirts of Edinburgh, as well as our part 1 and 2 videos, which are already posted. Also, if you are already subscribed to our channel, thank you so much. And if you're not, we would be honored if you would click that subscribe button as well as turn on the notifications to help us reach our first 500 subscribers.